Okay, um, so this will be part two in which I'll talk about this software that I developed when I was um, in my PhD and my very brief postdoc in Steve's lab. Uh, and this software was really born of a lot of pain, uh, trying to clean up other people's data sets that I was downloading. And it was sort of forged at a time when the data sets were, I like to believe, a lot messier than they are now, but um, and a lot smaller than they are now. So really, data cleaning was very important, but I, I still think it is very important. Um, so you know, data pre-processing is kind of a funny term. Um, you know, it's kind of like saying data preparation, right? And it can consist of different steps, but the end result is that you want to turn raw data into data that are suitable for your analysis, you know, your desired analysis, so co-expression analysis. And there's often multiple steps. And, you know, the reason that it's really important is just this GIGO principle, which anybody who's, you know, studied computer science knows. So, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, biology is messy and our ability to measure it is even messier. Every experiment makes assumptions. Not everything goes according to plan. So it's, I think, always good to have a sort of conservative view towards the integrity of your data. Um, the sort of initial steps of data preprocessing are very platform specific, which means that there's no way I could talk about them all in this talk. Um, but, you know, the goal is to basically move from raw data, you know, of intensities for array data or reads for RNA-seq data into a matrix where you have rows corresponding to genes or probes and columns corresponding to samples, right? And in my lab, what we try and do is sort of minimally process the data to get it into this form, and then we run it through the sample network R function uh, to get a better sense of it. Um, the major things that the sample network function tries to accomplish is the identification and removal of outlying samples, um, data normalization, if the data haven't been normalized already, and the identification and removal of uh, technical biases or batch effects. And the way that we do this last part is really um, by integrating an R package called, or actually it's not even a package, it's an R function called combat. And um, it's, you know, I think uh, become pretty popular uh, to correct for batch effects. So, you know, we can't claim any particular insights into, uh, you know, the vagaries of eliminating batch effects. All we've done is made it very easy to use that function because uh, the sample network function will automatically generate the files that combat needs to identify and erase batch effects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, co-expression can really be exquisitely sensitive, sensitive to both outlying samples and batch effects. Um, and so, what we try and do in terms of workflow, and again, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but we prefer to try and identify and remove outlying samples before we do data normalization. And the idea there is just that when you're normalizing data using a method like quantile normalization, you're effectively borrowing information across all of the samples. And so you don't want the bad samples to be kind of contaminating the good ones. So we try and get rid of those first. Uh, it doesn't mean you still can't look for outliers if the data have already been normalized. It's still good to be aware of them and remove them if you want. Uh, the problem is, you know, there's risks either way, right? So if you keep outlying samples in your data set for your co-expression analysis, that can potentially weaken biologically real and meaningful co-expression relationships, um, or it can strengthen spurious co-expression relationships. This, this is kind of mitigated by the use of BICOR, you know, that Steve mentioned earlier as a similarity measure. Um, but it's still something to be aware of. On the other hand, if you th keep throwing things out and being ultra conservative, you're diminishing your power and you're potentially losing interesting biology. So it's, you know, uh, this function has been written to be maximally flexible, um, not necessarily easy to use, but flexible. <laughs> um, hopefully somewhat easy to use. So, uh, you know, I, again, when I started thinking about this stuff, I was, it was like 2005, 2006, and I was just trying to find enough control human brain samples to build meaningful networks with WDCNA, and at the time that was hard, and I had to pull together multiple independent published studies, which of course had terrible batch effects, you know, and uh, it was a lot of work to try and get up to 50 or 60 samples. Now with the Allen Institute and other resources, we've got data sets with thousands of samples, and it's not quite as much of an issue, but I still think uh, is good practice. So. 
a common approach to identify an outlier, uh, by which I mean an outlying sample in a given gene expression data set, is to cluster the samples using hierarchical clustering uh, over all genes and just to see if anyone really sticks out, right? So here's a case where we're looking at, you know, 15 or 20 samples from prefrontal cortex from different human brains. And uh, we're clustering them effectively by um, uh, correlations across all probes on a microarray. And there's this one sample labeled in red that looks quite different, right? So, you know, I think my seven-year-old son could look at that and realize there's something different about that one. Um, other times, it can be more complicated, right? So here is a set of samples from human cerebellum. And you know, you ask the question, you know, same approach, right? Clustering the samples over all genes. Now find the outliers, right? I mean, these guys look like pretty obvious outliers. What about these guys? I mean, kind of, I guess, and maybe even these guys, but it's not quite as obvious, right? And now you get to a case like this, where you've got you know, a couple hundred samples, and the tree is getting really dense. This one looks pretty obvious, but beyond that, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in here biologically and technically. So, you know, I realized that the data sets were getting bigger, that just visual inspection of dendrograms was not really going to be a tenable way to accomplish this goal. Um, so, uh, and you know, as Peter mentioned, dendrograms themselves, you know, the structure can vary depending upon your distance measure, you know, what kind of linkage. And so we started thinking if there was another way to do this. Uh, and we turn to some network concepts to help us with this task. So, um, you know, just a very brief background, and Steve has mentioned some of this already. Um, two of the most popular node-based network concepts are the connectivity and the clustering coefficient, which are often used to describe the relationships among genes in a gene expression data set. Um, but you can also use those to describe the relationships among samples, at least in principle. And uh, I'm showing you here a couple of cartoon examples uh, in an unweighted network where we're looking at uh, two nodes, I, I and J, right? And uh, this is a fully interconnected network, right? So the connectivity is just the number of links that a given node has with its neighbors. And the clustering coefficient is basically the fraction of possible connections among a given node's neighbors that are shared, right? So this is fully interconnected, so the clustering coefficients are 1, which is maximal, right? Um, whereas here, this is a, you know unconnected network, right? So it's the opposite case. Here, if you look at the intermediate case, you can see um, this node I, right, has a connectivity of 5, because it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, links around it, whereas J has a connectivity of 2, right? Uh, now, when you look at the clustering coefficient, you can see that like node J, it has two neighbors, and they're both connected, right? So out of one possible connection, there is one connection, so it has a clustering coefficient of one. Whereas if you look at node I, right, uh, it has five neighbors, and there's only three links that are connecting them, right? So if you have a total of five neighbors, how many connections can they share? It's n times n minus 1 over 2, right, which is 10. So 3 out of 10 is 0.3. So the question is, uh, you know, as we started talking about this, uh, could we use these concepts to try and examine samples in a way that wouldn't depend on dendrograms, right, that would be independent of dendrograms? And, uh, you know, when you think about sample connectivity, which is really the one that we're focusing on the most, this is just a, another way of visualizing it, you know, where here you've got, imagine G1 through 12 correspond to 12 different samples, and we're reporting here, uh, just call it a correlation matrix, uh, every sample versus every sample measured over all genes in a given data set, right? Um, you can take the absolute value of this and raise it to a power. You can add 1 and divide by 2 to make it into a sign network. Uh, but when you take the row sum of those uh, scaled values, that gives you the sample connectivity, right? So we took that and we started calculating that for new data sets and looking at the distributions of sample connectivities. And when you look at those two examples I showed you earlier, and I should say we, we standardized the sample connectivity so it, be, it becomes a z-score, right? So you have the sample adjacency matrix, you take the row sum and you convert that sum into a z-score. That's all we're doing. Uh, when you look at this group of samples from prefrontal cortex, this clear outlier based on the dendrogram has the lowest standardized sample connectivity in the entire data set. 
which is totally consistent, right? Um, so it's an outlier by both measures. Now when you look over here, right, you can see that these three samples labeled in red have clear outlier status when examined in terms of their standardized sample connectivity. They have very low Z.K scores. But this one in blue, which is uh, statistically, you know, or at least in the dendrogram, it's indistinguishable from its neighbor, right? You know, you could flip that branch around and, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell any difference between them. But that one is clearly different than the other, right? It's not an outlier according to this metric. Yes? I'm sorry, based on known interactions? No, it's totally data. The question is, are these connectivities based on known interactions in nature? Is that right? Yeah. No, it's, it's totally data driven, right? So you've got your gene expression matrix, right? And uh, you're calculating the correlations amongst all possible pairs of samples over all genes or some subset of genes if you wish. And from there, that's it, right? So then you can calculate the sample connectivity on the basis of the sample adjacency matrix and uh, standardize it and plot that on the y-axis, and that's what we're looking at. Yeah. On which genes are you doing epic this approach? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I typically, you know, I, Steve was saying nice things about my gene filtering um, prowess earlier, but the, the truth is that I've evolved a little bit now, and I'm not actually doing a lot of gene filtering either. That was, a lot of that was computationally driven, right? Um, so if I don't need to reduce the gene lists uh, for computational reasons, I usually won't. Um, but let's say you have a biologically interesting subset of genes, right? Um, then you can repeat this analysis and focus only on that subset, and the results can be quite interesting. And in fact, the paper that is associated with this software did a deep dive in that strategy, looking at uh, differences in these sample network concepts for specific groups of co-expression modules that we know are real in the human brain, but what happens to them in Huntington's disease, right? So there's a separate R function called module sample network, which I'm not going to talk about today, but there's a tutorial for it on the same website as this one, and you can download it and uh, play around with it. Yeah. It, you No. So uh, by default, the way that we've coded it is we calculate a sign network. So we add one and divide by two, and then we raise it to a power of two, which is a convention. Um, so we're not really concerned about whether or not there's scale-free topology in the sample network. And I haven't actually, I don't even know if we look for that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I've always thought that this is kind of a sort of simple and intuitive way to think about differences among samples. I still think that. But um, I, so I was shocked, you know, when um, you know, I, I confessed that I'll use Google Scholar and I'll see who's been citing my papers once in a while. And I looked for this paper, and there was a group citing it that I thought for sure was an error um, because it was a team of NASA scientists analyzing spectral data from the Curiosity rover, and I thought it was just some algorithmic thing. But then I downloaded the paper and I read it, and sure enough, they're using this method, you know, so <laughs> the, the kernel of which appeared in our 2008 paper to analyze these spectral data from the Curiosity rover. So this is the strangest example of scientific cross-pollination in my career so far. Do, do you know the, the origin of this at all, Steve? No. no? Peter, do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. So um, anyway, so that's the first main job of sample network is to help you identify and remove outliers. Um, the second, you know, which is normalization, is um, you know something that obviously is important. Uh, 
This is an example of a data set, microarray data set from uh, 61 subjects, uh, 31 control samples, 30 with uh, bipolar disorder. And uh, these are unnormalized data that have been minimally pre-processed. These date back to Affymetrix arrays. Um, so there's no normalization that's been performed. And as you can see, when you look at the distributions of expression values across samples, they're all over the place. And so, you know, the method that we usually use for uh, gene expression normalization, at least in the world of arrays, is quantile normalization because it turns data like this into data like this, right? So it basically imposes the same distribution of expression values across all of the samples. And so you have an option to implement that within sample network if you so choose, uh, but you don't have to. Uh, the third important job of sample network is to help with batch effects. And uh, sometimes these are obvious when you look at the dendrogram clustering samples you know, across uh, all genes or probes. Uh, so for example, here's a meta-analysis where I've taken gene expression data from three published studies. And this is on the same platform. And I've clustered samples over all genes. And the letter uh, denotes the study. So H, B, and K are the three different studies. And you can see you know, clear segregation of sample clustering based upon the study, right? So those are batch effects, basically. And that's, that's not good. So um, the solution that we've settled upon in the context of sample network is this combat R function. This is the reference for it. And um, it's integrated within the function. So you can decide to run it if you want to. And if you run it, you know, hopefully you'll get a result like this, where then you can see that the samples no longer segregate according to the B, H, or K, right? So that batch effect has been erased. Um, sometimes, you know, the batch effects are not necessarily obvious in the context of a dendrogram for all the reasons that I described. I mean, there might be too many samples to see it. There might be just a lot of different sources of variability that are kind of intermixed. Um, but we can also look at that, you know, statistically via NOVA and we just do that by asking if PC1 of the entire data set is showing any association with your sample covariates, any sample covariate that you give the function. And um, you know, oftentimes, batch effects are PC1. In fact, when it's a strong batch effect, it usually is. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like. Mike, a question about combat. Yes. Yeah. Um, but they, they point out that it doesn't, probably doesn't do much if you have a large batch, multiple large batches. Mm. Just, and so I think it'd be useful to know in general. So I have this very primitive strategy. I'd like you to critique it. So if I have two big batches and they're like this, mm -hmm. I, go, uh, I go probe set by probe set or gene by gene and just force them to the same mean. I pick one as the reference. Mm. I just force them to the same mean. Is that? Steve's probably better positioned to answer that than I am, but I'll tell you my two cents. Um, you know, I'm aware of that feature of combat, you know, because I mean, I, when I read the paper, they made clear that, you know, there was, you know, arguments where you could basically change the number of samples for the different batches and things like that. But when I've tinkered with that stuff, it's never made much of a difference for me. So we implement it with the default settings and sample network, and the way that we test whether or not it's worked is we calculate the uh, p-value by ANOVA uh, for the covariate with PC1. And you can see quite clearly if that p-value is no longer significant, right? So that's how I know that it's working. Um, but Steve, do you want to add anything to that? Or? Sometimes combat doesn't work. Yeah. It some, works. Right. If one really wants to check after you apply combat, yeah. And I, sorry, I just want one more point to that. You know, when you run combat, right, you have a choice about whether or not to include uh, other covariates in the model, you know? And that's kind of a tricky choice, too, because sometimes I feel like, you know, like if you're trying to erase an effect associated with hybridization batch, but you include, you know, disease status as a covariate, which is defensible because it should be biologically meaningful, I feel like intuitively that can often sort of amplify, uh, you know, things that look like they might be related to disease when in fact I'm not sure if they are, you know? So that's just another thing to keep in mind. So, yeah. It's more precisely the second point what you touched upon and have a, a real quick question and you can see if you can comment. Uh, I, I have used combat, but uh, I have also seen some application to using target radio analysis on the for expression network. Uh -huh. But mainly that seems to be taking out all the core expression pattern in the data. Uh, 
I have not used it, so I, I don't have much experience with that. Yeah. Let me show you a few examples of the output before I attempt to do a live demo. Um, so this is an example of an old data set. This is an array data set, right? And uh, this is about 100 samples from human prefrontal cortex, a third control, a third bipolar, a third schizophrenia, and those are labeled by colors. And uh, this is the dendrogram. So, so this is, I should say, the visual output of the sample network function, which is interactive. And uh, you're able to interact with the function in an iterative process and say, OK, I want to remove this sample or that sample. And then it will regenerate this and export all these files so you can look at them. Um, but I'm just going to walk you through what we're seeing. So this is clustering all samples over all genes, or I should say all probes in this data set. And this is showing the standardized sample connectivity right, for all of these uh, samples. And over here is the standardized sample clustering coefficient. And what we found in practice is that uh, the relationship between the standardized sample connectivity and the standardized sample clustering coefficient uh, in a very, very clean data set becomes almost perfectly inverse, right? And we call that quantity core KC. And we talk about it a lot in the paper associated with the software. Uh, but what you're seeing over here is that that's not a negative, it's not an inverse relationship, it's a positive relationship, right? And so what that suggests to me as a frequent user of this function is that this is a very heterogeneous data set or that there's sample heterogeneity, which you can see in the tree, right? There's clearly something different about these samples. Um, down here, we're reporting uh, basically the results of the ANOVA analysis where we've taken a whole bunch of sample covariates and asked whether or not uh, they bore any significant relation to PC1. And you can see uh, the red line is a Bonferroni corrected p-value. And I believe that's uh, brain pH actually being the most significant uh, covariate associated with pH1, right? Uh, or sorry, with PC1. So this is the data as you start, right? So um, what we want to do is get rid of samples that have standardized sample connectivities that are quite low, right? Lower than the rest. Usually I would say minus three is a good rule of thumb. So if you throw out everything below minus three and you rebuild, um, now this is what it looks like. You can see this is starting to shift, right? The tree has changed. You have one clear outlier over here, but all of these metrics are then recalculated, right? So now we're going to throw out all of these guys that are still below minus three, throw out all these, these three guys below minus three, these two, this one, one more, and I think one more. Okay. Now, there's no samples below minus three. And you can see how this curve has shifted, right? It's now starting to approach negative one. Um, I would say at this point, OK, there's no more obvious outliers based upon the z.k distribution. So let's do our quantile normalization. So then we do that. And uh, that's what it looks like. And you can see over here, right, um, there is a nominal, nominally significant batch effect associated with hybe date, right? Again, this is a univariate, so it's kind of, you know, do you want to try and correct for that or not? That's kind of a user call, right? Um, but let's say that we do it. Um, you can see, again, see this is the p-value, minus log p-value. After calling combat, it drops to zero, basically, right? So you've erased that, you know, putative batch effect associated with hybridization date. This core KC is now negative 0.97, very much a closing, approaching you know, an inverse relationship. So in my worldview, this is a clean data set now ready for co-expression analysis, right? Um, here is, uh, yeah. Here's a second example. Uh, this is uh, from my lab where we've taken one sample of anterior cingulate cortex from one adult human brain and we've cut serial sections from one end to the other of the sample. We've extracted RNA from every section, and we've run aluminum microarrays, so about 94 arrays. Um, 
and uh, this is the whoops, this is the initial output, right? I should say, you know, this this tells you something, right? So um, this quantity here, the ISA, is the intersample adjacency, right? It's the mean inter it's the mean of the sample adjacency matrix. After all the pre-processing in that first data set, it's at 0.976, right? Here, in our first round of sample network, it's already at 0.989. Why? It always doesn't show up. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well. Um, well, take my word for it. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's because of the sampling strategy, right? The previous data set is all samples from different individuals, different data sets. Here we're talking about serial sections from one sample from one individual, right? So biologically, each section is very similar to the next. So the correlations among the samples are extremely high. But in a relative sense, you can still have outliers. The, uh, the obvious outliers over here are actually control samples. These are uh, reference RNA from total human brain that we bought commercially just to give us a reality check, check to make sure that um, all of the samples are what we thought they are. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're going to get rid of these guys. And um, yeah, now we have this one clear outlier, which is the same one up here. You can see this is already at minus one, which is indicating that the, there's great homogeneity amongst the samples. Now, but we're going to remove that. We're going to remove uh, this one below minus three. And I think there was maybe one. OK, that was it. So no more samples with z dot k less than minus three. So we're going to do quantile normalization. Now, I want you to watch what happens down here, right? This is a covariate called array ID. So these are alumina microarrays. You can run 12 samples per array, right? You can see right now, before, norm before normalization, there's a nominally significant batch effect that shows up. After you do quantile normalization, it's through the roof, right? So it's just an example of how uh, regular normalization methods do not get rid of batch effects, right? So we, of course, want to run combat to correct for this. So we run combat. Oh, I should say the, uh, the colors up there denote the different arrays, right? So I've colored the samples according to which way the array they were run on. And you can see their segregation according to color. And that's why the badge effect is so significant. When you run combat, um, it's gone, right? So, oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, you see that? Okay. So I'm now going to try and do something very dangerous, which is um, a live demo on a 2009 MacBook Pro, and uh, hopefully that doesn't, you know, completely break. Um, I should say that you know we um, wrote this so it could be flexible and. Uh, you can use it. It doesn't have to be gene expression data. Basically, anything that you can get in the form of a matrix, right? So methylation data, other kinds of data. Um, you need two files, basically, for the input. The first is just your gene expression matrix, right, where you have some identifier, so a probe set ID or a gene symbol or, you know, whatever uh, in column one, and uh, then the samples and all of their expression values. And the other is a sample covariate table and you want to have the rows of the sample covariate table in the same order as the columns of the expression matrix table, right? Um, so I'll just show you, well, I'll show you in one second, actually. This is the data set I'm going to run it on. This is um, the one that we analyzed in the paper associated with the software. Uh, and this is, uh, at the time, it was one of the largest gene expression data sets from human brain I could find, looking at different regions of the brain and controls and in patients with Huntington's disease. Um, so uh, there is a very detailed tutorial for the sample network R function on Steve's website. And um, I encourage you to download that. If you want to play around with it, you can download the same uh, expression and sample information files I'm going to look at with you here. And you can literally just copy and paste the code. Also, there's a, there's a new version of the sample network function. This is the one that you need to use if it's going to work, uh, 1.06. And uh, there's a number of R packages that you'll need to install um, in order to run the function, which are listed here. Uh, there's a whole lot of arguments to this function. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to go through all of these right now, but they are explained in great detail in the online tutorial and also in the paper. Um, so let me try this. 
Uh, OK, so just to orient you, this is what the expression matrix looks like, right? In this case, these are AFI arrays. So this is column one, the probe set ID. Column two is a gene symbol. And now we have the different samples, right, and their expression values. And then this is the sample information file, where each row corresponds to a sample. And you'll note that you see um, C23, this is cerebellum 23C. That's number one here, et cetera, right? So they, they're matched. And that function will check to make sure that those labels match. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other covariates that are both biological and technical in nature that you can feed in. OK. So um, you can tell the function to look at all of the samples simultaneously, or you can tell it to look at subsets of samples, you know, one subset at a time. And so this code here is telling it, it's just creating vectors that denote samples that are from different brain regions. And there's four different brain regions, right? So we're going to analyze these data one brain region at a time. You could also tell it to analyze the data one brain region at a time separately for the control subjects and the Huntington's patients. So it's really up to you. Um, and then this is the function call. OK. OK. So this is um, the initial output, right? And it's asking you for a response. First, it's giving you back this table where it's ranking all samples based upon their um, standardized sample connectivity, right? And um, it's saying, what would you like to do? Would you like to remove samples that have a particular standardized sample connectivity? So for example, if you say, I want to remove anything with less than minus 3, it's going to get out, it's going to throw out this one sample, right? Because that's the clear outlier. So let's just do that, right? We're going to say less than minus 3. And now it's going to get rid of that guy, and it's going to recalculate everything. <coughs> OK, so now that guy's gone. So OK, and I should note, in this case, I've chosen to color uh, the control and the Huntington sample separately. And so here it's plotting that core KC relationship between each subgroup of samples uh, separately. Um, so let's you know, say, OK, I'm going to be stringent, and I'm going to get rid of these guys because they look lower than the rest. So I'm going to say less than minus 2.5. And now it's going to get rid of those, and it's going to rebuild everything. OK, so let's just say that's enough. And I'm done now, right? Actually, you know what? Just by way of illustration, let's say for some reason, you know, um, I didn't like this one right here, right? I can also get rid of it by the row number, right? So 59. So if I say I want to, or let me pick one that's more odd. OK, well, let's just say 59, right? So 59, you're out of here. That will specifically remove that one sample, right? So if you have one that looks like it just clusters funny compared to the rest and you just want to get rid of it, you can just call it out by row number. Or uh, if you have some other reason you want to get rid of it, that's fine too. So um, now let's say you're done getting rid of outliers. You know, you've got uh, nothing below minus three here. You're satisfied. You just say none. OK, now it's going straight to quantile normalization. Because when I call the function, I had normalized set to true, right? If you set that to false, it won't do it. Um, so now the data have been normalized, and it's asking you, um, do you want to um, run combat? Do you want to call combat to try and get rid of a batch effect, right? And uh, in this case, you know, you can see that you know there is this effect associated with country. Right? So in this particular study, some of the samples came from the US, some of them came from New Zealand. Right? And you know, the authors mentioned that in the methods, but didn't try and explicitly control for it. Um, so if we want to try and get rid of that, we can. And um, I, actually, I don't think I've tested this, so this is probably where it will break. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's say country. We want to get rid of country. Right? Country will be used. Is this correct? Yes, that's correct. 
Um, it's asking you if you want to get rid of all batches or um, correct for a subset of batches. And I think the simplest thing to do is say all, okay? That's, and, um, you know, there might be cases in principle where imagine that you had samples from 10 different countries and it was only one of the countries that was a clear outlier. You could then select just that country to try and correct for using combat, right? In this case, there's only two countries, so we'll correct for both. So we say all. And now it's asking, do you want to include any covariates in the model, right? And so um, that's really a user call. You know, I mean, the authors of Combat recommend that you include covariates in the model if you think they're biologically meaningful. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I feel like that can often inflate uh, differences that may or may not be real. So I think for the purpose of today's demonstration, I'll say none. But you know, you could include those if you wanted to. And uh, now we hope it works. So. It automatically generates a sample information file that the combat function needs, uh, which is a time saver because it's kind of a pain in the butt to format everything for combat. This is the output from the combat function. And um, let's see. OK. And now when you look at country, you can see that it's improved. It's not completely eradicated in that it's you know, zero, but it's not significant. So OK, we're done with cerebellum. You hit Enter. And now it launches into the next brain region, which is called a nucleus, right? And um, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, I don't know if I need to go through all of the brain regions to kind of give you the sense of it, but I'll show you what the output looks like, right? So in the working directory, um, it creates this subdirectory, right? And within that, within the cerebellum that we just processed, um, it basically exports a number of files, including all of these plots that were generated, right? So for each step, you have a record of what it looked like and you know, what was the basis for your decision. Um, of course, it also exports the normalized data. So in this case, this underscore combat.csv is the normalized batch corrected data. This qnorm is the quantile normalized but not combat corrected data. And then this outliers removed is just the expression data after getting rid of the outliers but before doing quantile normalization or before doing batch correction in case you wanted that for some reason. Um, you can also see how things changed by each round, right? So this is looking at a variety of network metrics and how they improve uh, as a percentage from round to round of outlier removal, normalization, and combat. The good news is that everything is improving. Um, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it does. And uh, you know, again, it's designed to be flexible, right? So in my lab, we usually start most of our analyses with this function because we know that we're on a level playing field, you know, and we have a sense of what kind of uh, you know, statistics we should expect for a given data set in terms of the intersample adjacency and the core KC and things like that. Um, so that's pretty much the demo. And um, I should say that the um, reference for this is uh, in the talk, which will be posted online. And uh, this is the link to the website, uh, to the page on Steve's website that has the tutorial and the data sets and all that. So. Uh, does that make some sense? Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, how about, um, do you have any comments about what, uh, how you process RNA-seq data with that? Is there any yeah, uh, recommendations that you lost them from RBCM? Yeah, so um, I've, I've had to build in a few changes to it to deal with RNA-seq data. Um, so, uh, you know, in particular, the function does a check to make sure, well, let me see how it, um, yeah, so there's two things. Number one, um, the function checks to make sure that there are not uh, genes with zero variance, right, which is bad for trying to build similarity matrices. Uh, in microarrays, you don't have that because there's always background, but in RNA-seq, you often have genes that are just zero all the way across. 
Um, the other thing that it checks for is the presence of uh, expression values equal to zero, which you can't log transform, and it asks you if you want to add one or two to that to make sure that the function will work. Uh, those are probably the main changes, um, but it will work with RNA-seq data. You know, we use it all the time on RNA-seq data. Uh, I haven't tried it on methylation data yet, but hopefully soon. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Why don't you like quantile normalization on methylation data? Um, let's see. This is almost common knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see. So the data become unrealistic. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the plan there on the Yeah. Just a technical question. For, for the input file, why have two input files that require a transpose and some rather complicated matching to make sure you didn't drop one in one and leave it in the other? Because I'm always dropping columns or adding rows. Yeah. No, I, I think that's mostly a testament to my limited programming skills when I first started doing this. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm very much a self-taught R programmer, and if I had to do it all over again, I probably would do it differently, you know? But I eventually got it. It's like 2,000 lines of code with a lot of inefficient stuff inside of it, but it works. <laughs> and once I got it to work, I walked away from it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is about, you know, um, the different initial preprocessing steps for three prime AFI arrays versus exon arrays and things like that. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, this function won't do any of that for you, right? So it requires that you already do the transformation of raw intensity values to a matrix of expression values using, for example, AFI power tools or something like that in order to produce the initial gene expression matrix, right? So um, a lot of that stuff is platform specific and kind of difficult to build into one monolithic R function, you know. 